Our next speaker is doing a talk on, well, the talk is called Hub Spokes and 12 Cents Per Minute Generation. It's surrounding um, technology. And his name is Emeka Afigbo. So round of applause, please. Really like. I would always be the one to open up the door and see what's inside. You know, that, that feeling of joy when your code ran for the first time after debugging overnight. Technically, software is, you know, a set of instructions to achieve a certain task. And so, so this time around, I'm seeing problems in Africa as a task at hand. Africa is an emerging market, yeah? But there's so much potential. It's, it's, you know, it's getting fertile. Companies are springing forth. Uh, people are actually seeing the software career as a very interesting one. I got a Google scholarship. I think that's when I realized programming gives me a way to creatively express myself. The one game we've been working on is called Matter 2. We've reached about a thousand downloads. In order to understand what is responsible for the growth, it's why Google is in Africa. Basically, it's about three things, you know, access, relevance and sustainability. In a few years, yes, we will become a stable ecosystem. If coming to the world stage comes along, of course we'll take it. A full-grown African company, grown from, from the roots. That, for me, would be a major milestone, maybe the beginning of another story. I have seen the faces of the people who have played my game for the first time was so happy. One of my colleagues was showing stuff on the phone to one of the kids. And the look on that kid's face, <laughs> you know, is epic, you know, and it makes it all work. I just want to create magic moments. You just have to love something and then, you know, the sky is the limit. Okay. So that's... Um a video of, uh, an excerpt from the video actually, of some young African software developers who were opportune to attend the I.O. conference in San Francisco earlier in the year. The I.O. conference is um, pretty much one of the biggest gatherings of tech enthusiasts in the world. And um, it's fun, a lot of great things happen there. And um, yeah, so the reason I started with that video is just to give us all a glimpse into the potential that is locked in the youth or the young people in Africa, right? And when you see people like that speaking so passionately, one thing for me that comes to mind or what keeps me awake at night is how can we build or how can we create a sustainable ecosystem that can make sure that we have more and more of people like this coming forward to help us create the Africa that we want to be in. But to create, uh, to set the context, you know, for what we're going to be discussing, let's um, play with some stats. There's a popular saying that 39.5% of all statistics are made up on the spot. So join me as we make up some stats, right? In sub-Saharan Africa, we have about between 800 million to 900 million people or thereabouts. And the statistics tell us that um, this, there's a growth rate, an annual growth rate of about 2.3%, right? However, the statistics also tell us that Sub-Saharan Africa is a very young continent. About 40% of the people in Sub-Saharan Africa are between the ages of 0 to 14, right? So if you put all this together, mix them up, do some quick math, those of us who are familiar with compound interest, you find out that in about 10 years' time, we'll have over 400 million people who are between the ages of 10 and 24. So there are different ways of looking at this. For me, some people may say it's a time bomb. It looks like a time bomb. Because one question you could ask is, you know, what will all these people be doing in 10 years' time? For me, I'm more like a glass half full kind of person. So I prefer to ask myself, what can we do to guarantee that in 10 years time, we can tap into this massive pool of human resources to build the kind of Africa we want to be living in in 10 years time, all right? So, um, you know, 
for me, when I'm not standing here talking, really that's what keeps me up, trying to create that sustainable ecosystem. And I found out that one way of doing this is actually to try and make people passionate about technology. So we want to see, for me, I want to see in the next 10 years, if we can make 5% of that 400 million plus as passionate about technology as the people we saw in that video. You could feel the passion in their voices when they were speaking. They had hope. You know, they, they were looking into the future and it was like nothing, there ain't no stopping us now. So if we can make 5% of the young people in Africa as passionate as those people, I'm sure that we'll be getting somewhere. And why do I say this? I believe that technology has the power to transform lives. And in particular, internet technology, information technology, or information and communications technology as it's called these days. And why do I say this? When you have people with passion like that, there's a multiplier effect. For every one person that is as passionate as those guys, you reach out to more than 100 people, if not more, in some cases, thousands, and there is a multiplier effect. Why do I say this? I say this because of personal experience. Now, again, the fact that I'm able to stand before you today and you know, talk about things like this, if I was to trace it back, I would put it down to a phenomenon which, or a concept which, when I was in school, it was called uh, I think the phrase we used then was a study center. But nowadays they are called tech hubs. What are tech hubs? Tech hubs are basically you get a space, you make sure that space has the basic infrastructure, which for ICT really means internet connectivity and in this part of the world, constant electricity. Right? And then you fill that space up with innovative minds people who want to create, people who are willing to learn by collaboration. And then you add a special ingredient called X, which I'll reveal later. Now, why do I say that I have a personal experience? Maybe we should take, a, a, you know, roll back the tape to many, 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 many years ago, right? When my journey started um, in the southeast of Nigeria, the University of Nigeria, so that's the society. Now, I belong to a generation that I like to call the 12 cents per minute generation. What do I mean by 12 cents per minute? 12 cents per minute, which going by the dollar exchange rate at the time was 10 naira per minute, was what we had to pay to access the internet in your neighborhood cyber cafe, if you were lucky enough to have a cyber cafe in your neighborhood at the time. This was between the period of, say, 1998 to 2002. How many of us in the room paid 10 naira a minute to browse? Okay, so we're all part of the 10, 12 cents per minute generation. And in those days, as we all know, if you really wanted to browse for a long time, you had to do what we called overnight browsing. Right? And you had to pay like a thousand bucks in my case. I had to travel from all the way from Osaka to Enugu, a distance of like 70, 80 kilometers to have access to the internet. And I'm making this point because it is this generation that I'm talking about, the 12 cents per minute generation, that understands what I like to refer to as a digital rebirth. Because at one point, when I was in school, at one point when I was in school, I was studying electronic engineering. And then you could either aspire to work in an oil company, or if you're fortunate, you get to work in a bank. A career in technology was not on the cards. And then what happened? There was a wave of telecommunications deregulation across Africa. And Slowly, we got to hear about this thing they call the internet, and that everything was possible on the internet. All you had to do was, uh, what was the phrase? 
log on to the internet and magic. So for us, the computer now became more than just a tool. It became a tool of communication, research. And we now discovered that it actually became a tool that we could use to feed ourselves. So that's what I mean by digital rebirth. Now, when I was in school, somebody had the bright idea. There was this place, the building you see right there at the bottom right. It was uh, what we call a study center. The Uhere Study Center used to be called. Then students used to go there to read books. You know, books with paper that you flip. Right? And then um, a man called Pius Onobaedo had the bright idea at the time that, hey, why don't we put computers in this place and let guys come around and learn how to program? And it wasn't just coming around to learn how, he, it wasn't like he was teaching us how to program. We were all learning together. Now, I wasn't even one of the main people who used to go to that study center, but my friends used to go there. And what they learned rubbed off on me. We all used to hang out together, you know, discuss everything and so on. And then when we graduated from school, we were, shall I say, fortunate or privileged to catch the eye of somebody who wanted to start a company in Nigeria and needed young minds, you know, sharp boys who could write code, basically, and who understood what then was called web development. So we basically became the tech arm of this company, and we pioneered, we're well, one of the companies that pioneered web technology in Nigeria at the time, and from there we grew, took it to other parts of Africa, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Uganda. We even managed to sell ice to the Eskimos by doing projects in Sri Lanka and India. And then, of course, you know, there's a saying in southwest Nigeria that 20 children cannot play for 20 years. So boys grew up, went out, started their own thing. And today I can tell you that people, you know, some of the people I know who are part of this system at the time, within that gap, have, you know, gone on to either found or co-found their own companies. And just, this is just the back of the envelope estimate, right? Those companies put together have done like $15 million in revenue over the past seven years. And this is a very, very conservative, very conservative estimate. Very, very conservative. And they did this, they've done this in the hostile environment that we have in this part of the world for businesses in information technology without any major financing from any VC or anything like that. Maybe they odd overdraft here and there, you know, to keep things running. But they've managed to pull this up. Now, this story I'm telling is not unique. I mean, you know, I'm sure if you look back, if you belong to this 12 cents per minute generation, you look back, you can pick out a few germs like this that have achieved the kind of thing I'm talking about. And for me, really, I really trace it back to the knowledge that was shared at Uhere Study Center back in the city. Now, the tech hub phenomenon is gradually catching on, slowly. And um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, these are, this is just a representation of the few tech hubs we have, from the Joko Labs in Dakar, to the Meltwater Institute in Ghana, to the sea co-creation hub in Yaba, Lagos here, to even the, there's ajegunle.org in Ajegunle, yes. There's the Mbono incubator in South Africa. There's the iHub in Nairobi, M Labs. There are a few of them doing really great stuff, churning out young minds that are going out to start companies that are going to build the Africa that we dream of. But if you remember the figure I pointed out initially, 400 million plus. And if we assume that each person has or influences like 100 or 1,000 people, you find out that 
with this number of tech hubs, let's say there are like 50 young minds in each tech hub. We are still a very, very long way off. So, you know, for us to gain momentum, for me, two years from now, this is the kind of picture I want to see of Africa. We need more of these hubs, more of them. And we need not just the infrastructure, the space, the, you know, facilities and all that. We need the X factor. And what's that X factor? You. Right? Because, yes, you have the facilities, you get the young minds, you know, they are collaborating and so on. But without engagement from those of us who belong to this generation I'm talking about, the 12 cents per minute generation. We form the spokes that connect the hub to the real world. It's all going to come to naught. Now you may ask yourself, is it money I'm going to give? I don't have money, I'm just making my regular salary. And it goes beyond cash or kind donations. We need your engagement. You have something to offer. You don't have to be a technology person. What have you learned? What do you need in all your experience using the internet or trying to use the internet in your day-to-day -day life? How can these people help make it better? How can you mentor them? How can you tell them that, hey, you know, this product you're building makes sense, but you know, for me to use it, it would be better if you did it like that, and so on and so forth. That kind of engagement, support, that's the question you should be asking yourself. So before I leave you, I'd just like to say um, there's a tech hub in your neighborhood. At least I know there's one here in Lagos. There are several in Lagos, actually. Just take out time, find out where they are, pay them a visit. They usually have events from time to time. Attend one of these events and just find out with me if it's possible to achieve that 5% ratio of people who are passionate and who understand the transformative nature of technology and are willing to make this change lives. Thank you. <laughs>